Well, hello. I hope this finds you well. I want to try something a little bit different this week where I kind of talk through my sermon text. And as I kind of got the outline going, to see if this kind of helps me put some thoughts together so that Sunday morning I can communicate a little more clearly and accurately as we preach from God's word and hear what God would have to say to us from his word. So let's begin. Our sermon text this week comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. I'm going to read it for you here. It says, But you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. He is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. So in this text, as I've kind of been thinking through it a little bit already and looking at it in the Greek, you see that there are a few commands, imperatives that Paul gives to Timothy here as he ends this letter in just a few verses. I've entitled this, On the Church, Fight the Good Fight, Part 2. Back in chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Paul urges Timothy to fight the good fight as he describes two guys um, named Hymenaeus and Alexander who stopped fighting the good fight. They stopped pursuing Jesus and thus, Paul handed them over to Satan so that they might learn not to blaspheme. So here again, that was in chapter 1, verse 18. And now coming here at the end of the book, in chapter 6, verse 12, he says again, fight the good fight. But that's not the first command. The first command Paul tells Timothy to do is to flee. He tells Timothy to flee. Flee from these Things Now, when I was in seminary, one of the things that my professor told me is to never use the word things in a sermon. It's not very descriptive. But what are the things that Paul is telling Timothy to flee from? If you remember back to our passage last week, Paul has described people who took part in false doctrine. They taught things that didn't agree with the testimony of Christ or did not pursue Godliness did not promote godliness. Excuse me. So this is what Paul tells Timothy that that person is like. That says that that person is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreements among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a means to material gain. And again, then in verse 9, he says, But to those who want to be rich, they fall into a temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. By craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. But then Paul says, But you, man of God, you person of God, that's really anthropos. It's, it's the word for human being. You, person of God, man of God, flee from these things. Flee from the love of money because it is the root of all kinds of evil. Flee from false teaching because it encourages dissension and arguments over words. And, and even thinking that godliness is some means of material gain like Christianity is a Greek get-rich-quick scheme. He says to Timothy, and I think we can also hear it to us. But to you, man of God, flee from these things. Flee from these things. Part of the action of Christianity is not just pursuing God, but also fleeing from sin. Let me say that again. Part of Christianity is not just fleeing towards God and pursuing good things. It's also fleeing from sin. We must flee from sin if we are to honor God like he should be honored. We have to leave behind those former ways of life. We have to leave behind the 
the lying and stealing and cheating. And yes, Christians sin and there is forgiveness for those sins. But as we pursue a holy life, a life that is in Christ, a life that is characterized by the Spirit of God, a life that is transformed by being a part of the bride of Christ, we ought to flee from sin. So Paul tells Timothy, flee from these things. Flee from the things of the flesh. Flee from the things that would draw you away from God, but instead strive to towards righteousness. As we've looked through the book of 1 Timothy, we've seen where the church in Ephesus was failing to live out their new identity in Christ and instead were living in old patterns of the flesh. They might have had the appearance of pursuing piety, but instead... They were wallowing in their sin, living like nothing had happened at their salvation. But Paul urges Timothy to flee these things. This is a very Christian attitude. It is ultimately about repentance. As we've talked about repentance before, repentance is simply to turn around. It's to turn from going one way and instead go the other. When we become a Christian, we repent of our sins. We turn away from them and turn towards Christ. We must pursue God and his holiness and his ways and his commands. But we must also turn away from those sinful desires that glorify us, that magnify our own status, that feed our pride that give glory to us and put security in our possessions. We must flee sin. But Paul doesn't stop there. If you keep going, he says, But you men of God, verse 11, flee from these things and pursue. This is the next imperative. The next command is to pursue these things flee from these things those things named above the love of money and all that comes with it but pursue and listen to what he says to pursue righteousness godliness faith love endurance and gentleness Paul says for Timothy to flee from these things the love of money and false doctrine but instead to pursue righteousness To pursue being righteous before God by following his commandments, by giving of himself for the Lord. To be righteous is ultimately to not follow your own standards anymore, but to follow God's standards. To live by his ways and his rules. That's ultimately what righteousness is. It's to be right. To be standing firm on your own actions, knowing that you have done what is right. It's another word for justice, to live well, to follow the rules, to be upright in your standing, to not have to worry about if you were good enough or bad enough, but to be righteous is to follow the commands, to be obedient to God and to his word. He also says to pursue godliness. We've talked about this Time and time again has been walking through 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is the letter where Paul uses this term more than anywhere else in the New Testament. Godliness. This attribute of being like God. This attribute that refers to the idea that the Holy Spirit has been so transformative in your life that you stop looking like yourself and look more like Christ. That because of your path that you don't pursue the things you used to pursue instead you pursue the things of christ that you cease living for yourself and you outwardly and visibly look like you're living for the kingdom of god pursue godliness he also says to pursue faith time and time again we've seen this idea of faith come up again faith is the assurance of things hoped for the confidence in things not seen that's what hebrews tells us 
And we should be pursuing this faith, faith particularly in God who has loved us and saved us and has given us a promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. And Jesus says in Matthew 28, 20, and remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Put your faith in Christ. He will never disappoint. Pursue faith, but also pursue love. This love is not just a love like anyone else has, but this love is agape love. It's the most common word for love in the Bible. This is a self-denial type of love. A love that doesn't look out for your own interests. A love that looks out for the interests of others. A love that means to lay yourself aside to pursue goodness. Love is something that doesn't come natural to us. When we're really young children, we don't want what other people want. We want what we want. We want our own comfort, our own goodness, our own happiness. We don't want what others want. So Paul says to pursue love, and not a love that looks out for yourself, but a love that looks out for others. Paul described this in Philippians chapter 2 when he talks about Jesus who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or to be used for his own advantage, but instead he emptied himself. God loved us to the point where he didn't look out for his own advantage, but instead looked out for our advantage. He gave himself for us, so we too are to pursue love. The next is A great word, endurance. It's also the word we translate patience in some cases. If you can get a little nerdy with me just for a moment, this is the word hupomone. It's the word for endurance or patience, but it literally means to bear under the load, to bear up under something, holding on to something. You've heard it said, don't pray for patience. Because God's going to give you things to be patient about. Well, this is true here. It's, it's talking about bearing up under the load, keeping firm, enduring like when you run a race. To keep going and going and going. I can remember when I was young, I was on the swim team. And I always wanted to swim the really long races, but I didn't quite have the endurance. In order to swim really long races or to run really long races or even to do any kind of exercise, you have to have endurance. It means you can keep going even when it gets hard, even when the the pain goes on and on, long and long and long. We have to exert effort time and time again and keep going and keep going even when you're tired. We must endure. Paul tells Timothy to Pursue endurance. And finally, Paul ends his list with a little bit different of an attribute. It shouldn't be that odd to us. But if we look at this last attribute, he tells them to pursue. He tells them to pursue gentleness. Now, gentleness is one of the fruits of the Spirit, Gentleness is one of the attributes of a pastor. He must be gentle and not quarrelsome. But at the same time, gentleness is not one of these things we often think about when we think about fighting. Fighting. How do we fight gently? I think ultimately the way that we fight gently is by (laughs) by putting our trust in God. By knowing that he will fight for us. By giving ourselves to his work. We pursue gentleness because we ultimately know that it's not our effort that wins the battle. But we can fight and genuinely fight, but do it gently.
trusting in his providence and his provision. So, flee from these things. Pursue these things. And the next thing, the next command Paul gives Timothy is to fight. 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 He says, fight the good fight of the faith. Fight. Struggle. Pursue. Make war upon. Don't just let life happen to you. Fight for it. Christianity is not a passive sport. Yes, God fights for us, but he invites us to be a part of what he is doing. And we must fight for the truth. We must fight for our godliness. Fight for our holiness. We must fight for our identity in Christ. We must fight our flesh, fight the devil, and fight lies. Christianity is not a passive sport. Christianity must be pursued. God doesn't ask us to just simply sit on the sidelines, but he asks us, indeed commands us to be actively engaged in worship of him, but also in pursuit of him. Fight the good fight. That means we have to stay up on our prayer life. You know that as a Christian, one of the privileges that we have is that we are sons and daughters of the king. That means that when we approach God, we approach him not as someone who can't get to him, but we approach him as a son or daughter and we ask him things. We ask him not as a stranger, but as a child. We must stay up on our prayer life. Because as we have fellowship with God, as we learn from him, as we have communion with him, as we take part in this spiritual life, we have energy and willpower to fight the good fight of the faith. We must stay up on our Bible reading. Brothers and sisters, God has given us his word. It is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is good for the Christian life. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, God says that, or Paul says that every word of God, every word is God breathed. It's theonostos. It's it comes out of the mouth of God. It's useful for teaching, for correction, for reproof, and for training. It is good for us. Stay up on your Bible reading and stay up on being a part of the community of the church. We cannot fight the Christian fight alone. We must stay in it together. We must fight together. Keep on going. If you remember back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, as we talked about fight the good fight part 1, there were two guys named Hymenaeus and Alexander who stopped fighting the good fight. They gave up. They quit pursuing. And therefore, Paul set them outside of the church. Not really as a punishment, but so that they would realize the gravity of their sins and long to come back. We must fight the good fight. Paul doesn't stop there. Next, he says, take hold. Take hold of eternal life. As a Christian, we don't just get to think about this life. But we know there's a life to come. That because we are in Christ, this life is not the end, but we look forward to an eternity with God. Paul tells Timothy to take hold of eternal life. 
to which you were called and about which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Take hold of the treasure that was given to you in Christ. Take hold of the truth of the gospel that when we die, we will be present with the Lord. And on the last day, Jesus will raise us from the dead. Take hold of this eternal life that is in God. Take hold of eternal life. It is yours in Christ. Finally, Paul charges Timothy to keep. Keep this command, verse 14, without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fight the good fight and keep the commandment. Paul says in verse 13, In the presence of God who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. Paul charges Timothy to keep this command in light of God. Because it is about God and to God. And let's not miss this glorious statement about God in verse 15. He charges him in the presence of God to keep this command until the day of Christ's appearing that God will bring about. Until the day Christ comes again, we are to pursue holiness, righteousness, purity, love, gentleness, endurance. We are to fulfill these commands until Christ comes again, and Christ will come again. Paul lets us know that we can have confidence that God will send Christ back to earth, that Jesus will come again because God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign. That means he's in control. He's in charge. He is the king of kings. There is no one higher, no one with more power, no one with more authority, no one with more dominion. He is the Lord of lords. That is, he is in control of all. There is no one who has lordship over God, our King and our Lord, he is in charge. He is the big boss. He is in charge. He is the man who we submit to. He is the Lord of Lords who alone is immortal. He lives forever. He has no beginning and no end. The word here for immortal literally means no death. It is athanatos. Ah, being the Greek prefix for not. And Thanatos, if you are fans of the Marvel franchise, know that Thanos is the, the big villain. His name literally means death. And here Paul says that our God is Ah Thanatos. He is immortal. He is without death. He lives in an approachable light. No one can see him or has seen him. And to him be honor and eternal power. Amen. Because he is worthy. He is powerful. He is mighty. And he is deserving of all of our praise. Friends and family, hear me. Keep the commandment of Christ. He is worthy and worthwhile. And he will reign forever and ever. That's kind of where I am now with the thoughts off the top of my head, just reading it and thinking about it a little bit. I hope 